we left off with this quote by Otto von Bismarck, where he, upon becoming Chancellor of Prussia in 1862, puts forth this idea that the rest of the German states will join with Prussia under the leadership of the Prussian king and become Germany through nationalism, but not nationalism the way it was expressed in 1848 and 1849 with a lot of liberal ideas and let's have a constitution and rights and participation. But Bismarck says, no, we're going to go out, we're going to use blood and iron. We're basically going to go to war. That's where you see blood and iron, right? In a war. And through our victory in war, our victory on the battlefield, we will inspire nationalism in all the other German states that they will willingly join with Prussia, give up their own autonomy, and become Germany. Before you scoff at this idea of nationalism uh, resulting from blood and iron, I want you to consider a modern-day kind of analogy. Okay, think of our sports teams and how proud we are when the hits are really hard in football, right? We're proud that our athletes are tough and can tumble. Don't forget Kurt Schilling's bloody sock in the 2004 Red Sox World Series. And let's not forget that there is this sort of unifying aspect of being a Boston professional athlete. Remember the Red Sox you know, taking their World Series championship trophy to the Celtics game, sort of inspiring the Celtics to then go on. And I know we're sort of all mourning the NBA right now, but um, certainly inspiring the Celtics to go on and, and win the championship. And, you know, this notion that everybody loves a winner, you know, think about who we're all still so in love with right now our guys in black and gold. Yes, our Boston Bruins. And when we watch Bruins games, uh, you know, notice how excited the crowd gets when there are these hard hits, especially if there's blood on the ice, you know, especially when the players start fighting. This is what gets everybody, you know, all unified and riled up. Right? There's definitely something to Bismarck's theory that even translates to today. And of course, when the Bruins win, we feel a part of that. We feel unity. Okay, they won the Stanley Cup this year, and notice just how large the parade was. Millions of people came out, you know, in unity to cheer on the Bruins and celebrate with them. Okay. So going back to Prussia in the you know, mid-1800s, Bismarck needs to find a way to get Prussia to engage in wars. He says, if we fight wars and, and we win, not only could we take some territory, but more importantly, you know, he's using nationalism. He's using people will be so proud they'll want to join with us. The first thing that Prussia does under Bismarck is they team up with Austria and they fight a war against Denmark. All right, Denmark had some territory that, you know, they considered to be German territory. And so Prussia and Austria formed an alliance, and as a result, they take Holstein and Schleswig and add these kind of German territories to their German confederation. Then, two years later, um, Bismarck really pulls a fast one on Austria, takes advantage of, of them being in a little bit of a weakened state. And attacks them for Holstein. Um, now, they had been allies two years earlier, so Prussia was fully aware of Austrian capabilities and took advantage of this knowledge. Uh, they also take over other northern German states, including Hanover, and this is the end of the German Confederation, which, if you recall, as a result of the 1815 Congress of Vienna, the German Confederation was controlled by Austria, so they are no longer in control of Germany. But the big kahuna is Napoleon III and France. And Bismarck is trying to find a way to go to war against Prussia. He finally gets the opportunity in 1870 when there is a dispute over the Spanish throne. As a result of this dispute, Napoleon III and France do go to war with Prussia. And Prussia is victorious. But, of course, there's a little more to the story, so you have to wait for part three.